Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for the very last time here today on day one of IoT Day Slam 2023. Thank you very much for joining the IoT community here at this amazing conference to kick off 2023 for us, our first of four this year. We'll be wrapping up this day today um, with our Security, Privacy and Trust in IoT Center of Excellence panel. We're a couple of minutes ahead of schedule. Um, and so it's a good thing and a bad thing. And so far as folks that are obviously wanting to join the session on time, haven't yet joined, so we'll give them the benefit of courtesy of letting the session start on time. Um, so why don't I do this? Um, David, in the interest of giving folks a chance to join the room, the various bridges, whether it be here on Zoom or on our LinkedIn Live, go slow with your intro and at least give give, you know, give, give folks a chance to, to join us. So I'm going to turn the floor and the stage over to you here, David. Okay, uh, that's fine. Um, hi, everyone. This is Dave Mayer, uh, CTO of Intertrust technologies. Uh, today, we're going to focus on notions of identity that are at the heart of security, privacy, and trust in IoT. Starting with trust, we are going to talk about how we rely on strong notions of identity to implement zero trust security models, and how these work with the new unified SASE approaches to security services for, I for the IoT. We'll talk about distributed identity solutions and digital wallets and how these support much more flexible and efficient automation capabilities using smart contracts. And then we'll, we discuss how we can authoritatively publish rich identity, identity information at IoT scale, making it easy to validate the various attributes of the entities that participate in IoT automation, which is sub crucial for cyber uh, security and cyber physical applications. Finally, we discuss the conundrum of identity and privacy, specifically how we can publish and demand a rich identity information necessary to reliably execute IoT transactions while preserving privacy. So that's a tall order in 45 minutes, but uh, uh, we have the experts here to proceed. We have George Young, uh, CISO and uh, Chief Technologist at uh, CBT. Uh, Ted Delavescia, CEO at Symbotics, Evelyn D'Souza, Trust, Privacy and Compliance Leader at Oracle, and Corey Lachkowski, uh, Solutions Architect at Red Hat. So, uh, George, why don't you uh, uh, introduce uh, your area, which I think is going to be about zero trust and uh, and uh, uh, SASE implementations and 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 how they uh, interwork and the differences between the two. Yes, thanks, David. Yeah, so you know, with IoT, um, it, there's been a a lot of tremendous benefits from it. We're collecting uh, of data, aggregation of data. Um, and, you know, with that um, collection of information, it also has a, it presented a problem, and that is basically these um, uh, attack vectors, uh, which is what we call it. So you've got the uh, cyber attacks, you know, threat actors out there that you give them more uh, points of entry uh, to um, uh, get in, into a network or into an organization and then collect information, do reconnaissance. And so the, you know, the the aspect or the the promise of uh, providing um, more data that can be aggregated to uh, to utilize to to build efficiencies, you know, that's all fine and good, but unless you secure that information, unless you, um, you know, kind of take care of your your shop, if you will, um, you're at risk. And it's and it's not only just in the traditional IoT environment, but specifically. Uh, the work that we do at CBT, we, we deal quite a bit in the OT space. And so at that point in time, now you're dealing with uh, entities such as industrial plants and such. And of course, they carry uh, their um, set of um, issues, if you will, chemicals um, and in, um, oil, gas, things like that. So so now you're now you're talking about, you know, human risk or human life uh, being at risk if something were to go wrong. So really what you need, um, and that's what we're addressing today, is the um, stronger identity solutions. And I know all of us are going to take our, our slice of, of our little specialties and talk about you know, how, how to approach this or thoughts that you should give to approaching this market. But uh, so anyway, so in this, what I'm going to talk about is really how 
uh, Zero Trust and SASE, which is basically Secure Access Service Edge. You know, it's just it's a it's a funny acronym, people. You know, SASE, but um, but it's really important to understand the nuances between the two, and these are very good um, solutions. But um, once again, there's not just one solution that solves all the problems for cybersecurity. We're always you know, looking to um, enhance uh, what we do and to protect uh, not only our, our business, our information, but uh, human life as well. So let's start talking and let's kind of you know, dive into like zero trust specifically, and then we'll get into, uh, um, you know, SASE itself. So zero trust started back in not too long ago, may, for some of us maybe long ago, about 13 years ago um, from Forrester. So 2010, Forrester coined the phrase zero trust. So really the motto of zero trust itself is never trust, but always verify. And that not only goes from outside entities, but also inside entities, inside your organization itself. So some of the things that we um, have implemented or the zero trust architecture implemented is basically there's four constructs to it, right? You have to understand who the users are, right? You understand you have to understand who you're what devices that you're um, uh, gathering information basically your inventory of it you know because a lot of sometimes devices can provide malware um, and then I can think of one example right now there was a casino years ago that the actual uh, thermostat within the fish tank was wireless and so they used that as an entry point to get into the casino um, so you know there you go and then you have to authorize once you have um, authentication of the, um, uh, the, the user itself, there's also the authorization of what data can you get entry to or access to, what level do you have? And then there's also the transaction of the data. When the da data is in motion, the transaction itself, that's really, that's really important. So in some of the authentication methods that are in place right now, and these aren't all of them, you've got, you know, their traditional multi-factor uh, multi authentication, biometric and uh, device certificates, and some of the vendors that are out there, your Cisco's and your Palo Alto's and, and such. Now on the, uh, on the SASE side, the Secure Access Service Edge, that was coined not too long ago by our friends at Gartner. So 2019, Gartner uh, coined the phrase. And really the, the idea was to take zero trust and add these other components into it. And so now you have, um, you know, you have a more comprehensive um, solution um, to the problem because really, Zero trust was really kind of a point solution, in my in my opinion. And SASE is more comprehensive. And the benefits for SASE is it's really cloud based, right? Um, and it's distributed, so it gives you that. And when you had the you know pandemic that occurred, a lot of people went remote, and so you you were able to take advantage of being able to move um, to users to this model and provide secure access for their users to gain access to the components. Now there's basic, so it's really a convergence of networking and security, which is fantastic, right? But it, there's some problems there because you have a culture, an IT culture that, you know, you have your networking people and your security people, and sometimes it they don't, you know, initially blend together. So there could be a challenge there, but basically there are five components of uh, um, a SASE. One is SD-WAN, next-gen firewall, zero trust architecture itself, and secure gateway, and also the cloud access broker. Those are basically the, the five components, if you will, of SASE. And so you have vendors, one of them being Zscaler, Palo Alto, and there's many different others um, that provide this capability. So just to be aware of that. Now, now, I was saying, you know, we deal with the industrial side as well. So you have to be cognizant that there is another world out there where you have to worry about protocols on the industrial side, and they're not all IP. So you have to deal with gateways and things like that. So that is a challenge and something to kind of be aware of. So anyway, so that's kind of a, a quick version of, you know, um, Zero Trust as well as SASE. You know, we can go a lot more into that, but, uh, you know, we have we have limited amount of time. So I know Ted and I have been talking quite a bit about the, uh, the technology trends and where things are going. And so um, to deal with these critical, you know, factors, if you will, and maybe I, I thought Ted would be able to expand upon that and provide some insight as far as where things might be going. All right, now I'm sure you can hear me. Thanks so much, George. I appreciate it. Uh, 
And as usual, a good job introducing the concept of zero trust. And as you also mentioned, which I'll capitalize on, uh, is you know, this is a broad area. There's a lot of components that uh, are under this concept of digital trust. And uh, we're, as a team, going to uh, explore that. What I'll do today with my time, again, albeit limited, is to kind of st uh, st uh, stroke broadly across uh, a couple of key elements, things that people might be more familiar with, with regards to trust and digital or decentralized identity. Um, uh, and as it goes forward, uh, you know, obviously these concepts are complex, but as we move more and more toward the edge and the IoT environment or architectures that support an IoT operating system, if you will, become more complex because of the network relationships become expanded. So uh, if it's complex now with centralized systems, imagine how the complexity is going to expand, uh, you know, exp exponentially um, as we move more towards uh, the IoT. Finally, uh, what again I'll do is again introduce some concepts and then perhaps this uh, center of competency, um, uh, our security, privacy, and trust center of competency at the IoT community can drill down a little further at our live presentation uh, at the SAS Institute and carry in our June uh, upcoming SLAM event, which are always exciting. So um, just moving right along here, um, let me see if I can kind of get my screen to participate. Um, so what I'll do is again, talk about digital identity uh, as it relates to uh, you know, uh, the consumer side, right? So moving right into it, uh, you know, if you take a look at the screen here, uh, people are very familiar with digital wallets, or at least the concept of digital wallets. Apple's had one on their, uh, their mobile phone for quite a while and banks are starting to roll them out a bit. This chart indicates the explosive growth. Many might not be aware, uh, you know, the, for example, the number of unique wallets is exploding. And as a, as a portion of global e-commerce volume and global point of sale volume, you can see the, the positive trajectory slope is off the charts, right? I mean, so um, as physical wallets become less relevant, banks are developing these wallets in, in response to demand, right? Again, from a payment system. But what I'd like to offer as a thesis here is that perhaps this becomes a substrate, if you will, um, for uh, you know, going mainstream with regards to decentralized identity because of the adoption, because of the growth and the scale and consumers and now, uh, eventually businesses, and I'll get into that in a second, are using this, right? We could start to see perhaps the fundamentals uh, of why digital wallets become a pivotal centerpiece in this entire evolution. Why? Because a universal interoperable, if there were to be one, a uh, digital wallet would be a critically important tool, right? And it has the potential to allow people and enterprises to keep their confidential data safe and private and to build more trusted online relationships. You see the chart I have on the left there, just kind of highlighting, if you will, out of the five uh, elements of smart contract use, there's probably more, but Blockchain Council had five on there. I kind of circle digital identity uh, and the IoT uh, as being part of a linchpin of any IoT edge compute product and service, because simply it's a, lot, it's a way to run transactions and to interact with you know, your partners or your consumers. All right, we've got, uh, uh, it's not just a B2C situation, right? This is now expanding now to the corporate world. Right, uh, uh, where legal entities are a critical part of uh, what I would like to call a digital en entity, digital identity hierarchy. All right, so here the legal entity identifier coming from Glyph, which is an organization called the Global Legal Identifier Foundation, right, is a code comprised of 20 characters and they're a combination of letters. It's based on a standard, an ISO standard of 17442, if I'm correct. Um, and it's an identification system which includes details about you know the identity's ownership, its structure, the organization provides answers to questions about who is working for whom and with whom and who is who, right? So this public collection of LEI data is a worldwide directory, uh, and it and it really significantly increases the transparency uh, uh, within the global marketplace. Um, I sense it will affect every entity in financial, healthcare, supply chain, telecom, uh, most if not all sectors where trusted digital interactions involving legal entities occur. Um, and uh, you know, I believe it also is gonna be the, you know, the key, if you will, or the, uh, the impetus for continued massive decentralization of business transactions uh, and business in general. Uh, and of course, edge and IoT compute will pervade this whole thing. Again, the challenges, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, if you're gonna protect against fraud and theft you know, in a centralized model, as you start to decentralize all this, uh, I think legal identifiers uh, as a hierarchy, as a part of a hierarchy is really a, a sort of a smart strategy. Uh, it is a solid comprehensive approach 
uh, to digital identity. Um, so a quick nod to uh, uh, the launch of Open Wallet at the Linux Foundation uh, Europe. It's a project uh, with a mission uh, to develop an open source uh, engine, if you will, with secure and operable multi-purpose digital wallets. And we got Corey online here today from Red Hat, who is part of not only our COE, but obviously Red Hat's a key player in our IoT community group. Um, and uh, you know they published this graphic to demonstrate the various models of what is commonly referred to as digital identity. Just some quick nods to other movements that are you know kind of related in this space. You got the DIF or the Decentralized Identity Foundation. You got the Linux Foundation Trust over IP, which is a major push for trust, uh, and the Linux Foundation Edge. Right. So let's move right along here. They say and indicate that security, privacy, and trust are issues with this model identified by these red boxes. Now, primarily because there's an intermediary that centralizes information that increases the vulnerability, right? This is what's called a honeypot. When you've got your user ID, your password, your personal information, your profile, all in a central area. Obviously, the centralized uh, model also inhibits interoperability. Um, but, but decentralized is a key word here. And what the Linux Foundation is uh, moving first, they're the first global collaboration on open source code uh, for interoperable, which I mentioned earlier, multi-purpose digital wallets for entire digital ecosystems. A little closer to home here on the United States, uh, even the Rhode Island folks are doing it. Uh, you know, uh, Ms. Tanner here yesterday delivered context on how the state of Rhode Island is actually making themselves easier to do business with. That's a, a really great model uh, for any business to follow. Um, keeping with the theme, I'm going to give a shout out to Synadia, right? And you see here that trillions of dollars in mass decentralization of, you know, 43 billion internet connected devices moving forward. And Synadia has a, a fabric and they're working with any partner right now out there to really pull this all together to simplify um, PKI, which is public key infrastructures. Uh, they offer resilience, open source and interoperable, uh, almost as, you know, critical as a kernel to an operating system. And to close here, uh, a shout out to SAS, who uh, obviously another key player in our IoT um, community. Uh, they talk about uh, you know, remote uh, physiological monitoring, which is all about data. Many of you know this uh, relative to uh, uh, telehealth. And I'm a little bit over my time, but I'll just close this by saying that uh, you know, without the ability to have trust, these kind of models, these kind of convenience models for uh, uh, changing businesses that are staid and component and centralized, which healthcare would definitely represent, are being held back because, again, organizations are struggling. Join the, uh, join the IoT community. Uh, understand what's going on in InterTrust. I mean, Dave leading our COE is a privilege for us. Um, and learn more. Uh, and thank you very much. I appreciate your attendance. Thanks, Ted. Uh, so uh, let's talk about where things like uh, blockchains and some of the newer technologies that uh, are coming on board uh, fit into the, the solution space. Well, the web we've known and, and loved over the past uh, decades, uh, identity insurance has been deployed mostly for client server interactions and usually identifying the server uh, with PKI uh, and um, uh, individuals using things like uh, simple things like passwords. Uh, that's changing and changing fairly rapidly as uh, uh, Ted and, uh, uh, has uh, just indicated. Uh, we've also had uh, corporate VPNs, uh, which in, in also uh, include things like um, uh, uh, PKI uh, uh, and uh, uh, PKI services. But um, these have used just mostly password protocols to certificate-based PKI, which are not ideal for automated, large-scale, dynamic, and frankly, non-hierarchical cyber-physical systems, such as what I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but we just heard a vision uh, for reliable uh, automation involving real-time transactions, interactions among potentially trillions of sensors, devices, and services spread across many different domains and global infrastructure spanning many industries in, every, in very dynamic environments. And where we want to apply the notion of zero trust. So you have to verify everything. Uh, it's not just you have to, you, you uh, want to do that. And you want to do that uh, effectively for the kinds of applications uh, that uh, you need for IoT, which include lots of safety uh, uh, requirements. 
uh, secure, trustworthy identity uh, solutions need to scale much, uh, 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 much more massively, be more flexible, and support rich uh, notions of identity. And so we expect, just simply because uh, we're not going to abandon a, a lot of the infrastructure that we have for things like public key, uh, but we need to uh, go aggressively beyond PKI as we know it today. And I have key uh, deployments for energy systems, just to take one of many examples. Distributed energy resources want to exchange information with highly distributed transmission and distribution infrastructure. Uh, that infrastructure itself is is uh, is uh, widely uh, widely deployed and has a great depth. Uh, and um, we want to have those inter, uh, interactions uh, uh, protected from uh, cyber attacks. The overall vision now is to allow any new energy resource to simply appear and quickly find a buyer and a means of delivering power through dynamic networks owned by different entities consisting of devices from many different suppliers using services from many different providers, all in an environment that attracts cyber physical attacks, fraud and theft. Um, this is a much more uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, environment than anything that we've seen before. Uh, and deploying that globally is going to be very, very uh, challenging. Uh, and the IoT and the capabilities that George and Ted have, have discussed can provide solutions, but we need to have ways that the identity and identity attributes of all of the different people, services, and machine participants can be trusted provide ways of authenticating the data produced in these systems, which is another part of the identity challenge, is that we need to understand the provenance of the data uh, that we're going to be using for automation. So we need an efficient mechanism for publishing reliable, up-to-date identity information and means for users to efficiently verify the latest information in a timely way. That's always been a challenge for, for PKI, freshness of credentials, freshness of, uh, of uh, uh, revocation, et cetera. We need ways of identifying the components, but also the attributes of them, their memberships, their roles, their capabilities, trustworthyship, ownership, compliance, and lots of other attributes that need to be uh, verifiable. We need to identify and validate, as I said before, the provenance of data that is used in these systems. Data provenance is becoming increasingly important, especially for AI-driven systems, especially when you're going to be training uh, AI uh, models. Uh, you need to have, uh, you need to know what you're training them with and that you're going to be training them with uh, data of known provenance. So we believe the digital certificates can be part of the solution, but the scale for freshness of information, richness of identity, and deployment among many different organizationally unrelated entities among many layers of interaction, we all need more scalable and efficient solutions. And we believe that the best solution will involve networks of trusted, what we call assertion-oriented blockchains. These are different from the so-called trustless transaction-oriented blockchain most of us are, are familiar with. They are used to validate identities and identity attributes, providing bindings among those attributes and with cryptographic keys that are used to prove the, the validity of the attributes and, and the original identifiers. So with this approach, trusted authorities who are knowledgeable and trustworthy sources of information can publish assertions about identity attributes of participants in an IoT uh, uh, ecosystem. Blockchains can be decentralized across several dimensions by domain and topic of information so that you can have true experts in the domain uh, that you're talking about, whether it's, edge, uh, uh, whether it's uh, healthcare or energy systems, chemicals, you know, what have you. Uh, these are not going to be the kind of thing that you can centralize. Everybody knows every, uh, some centralized authority is going to understand the attributes of all of these different uh, uh, domains and all the different topics within those domains are going to have special specialized identity requirements. So we can have different blockchains operated by different entities whose information ingestion and agreement policies can be specialized to the type of information whose provenance and validity is being asserted. 
these blockchains can plug into a market-driven infrastructure. In other words, people who uh, know a lot about identity for different types of devices can start up a new identity service and um, register that with a, a central registration authority and provide uh, rich identity information uh, as it is needed. And uh, so we need we we want to see something that uh, the market will drive uh, when we, as soon as we find out that there's a need for additional market information, uh, market driven information, then you know somebody's going to fill that need. Um, so there's no time for details here, but this approach can be far more scalable, maintainable, and interoperable than our existing identity management systems. And it can maintain interoperability with certificate-based identity management. Uh, but one really important issue remains to be discussed when we were talking about making uh, very rich identity information available, and that is how do we preserve privacy? We see that we have to provide this uh, very rich identity information in order to provide security and an, an accountability for all of the things that were going to be automated. So uh, how do we now um, preserve privacy, given the fact that we're going to be motivated to publish much more and much more invasive information about uh, all kinds of entities? So Evelyn, uh, Corey, what, what do you guys think? Evelyn, maybe you can, you can uh, start off uh, uh, the discussion on the, on the privacy aspects. Hey, thanks, Dave. Um, so um, in particular, I'm gonna focus on you know, the balance. Can you have digital identity and privacy simultaneously? And then I think Corey's going to focus on the differences between um, privacy and security. Um, so I want to start off by asking people like, you know, you can raise your hand um, or you could even um, use the annotate tool, which is in the top uh, menu, if you can find it and tell me, you know, do you believe we can have both of these things or, you know, what are your thoughts on this? And as you're doing that, I am going to, um, you know, move forward and Sorry, what have I done here? Okay. And start just, you know, just um, giving you an idea of some of, you know, what I believe are some of the privacy implications as we move to this um, paradigm of the digital identity. So back in about 2019, the Electronic Frontiers did a, a survey and, you know, did some research into this whole thing of, you know, what if we were all issued digital driver's licenses, would consumers, everyday consumers like you and I, or those who maybe are not as digitally savvy, understand what was being collected about them? And would those who were digitally disadvantaged find themselves in a worse position in terms of how their data may be used in ways that they may not have anticipated. And I wanna use this as an example. Imagine you have a digital driver's license. You go in and you buy a bottle of liquor. What is to stop the issuer or the verifier adding your age to your digital identity without you necessarily knowing it? So as you consider these array of uh, possible use cases, what might get added to someone's digital identity, either by the issuer or by a verifier? And what is it that we can do to make this much more readily understood by consumers? I'm also going to use this as an example today. So we've often talked about consent-based mechanisms for handling digital identity. So today, when you look at consent-based mechanisms for using a service, how many of you have noted that as you um, look at, you know, consenting to the terms of the service, you go onto a website, you're presented with terms and conditions. Today, that's even more complicated than ever. In the state of California, we have a do not sell clause that people need to be presented with. 
How many times when you think about consenting to the terms of a service, do you truly understand what you're consenting to? And how might it be that we design a, 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 you know, a digital identity in a way which is distributed, you know, speaking along the lines of what my other peers have covered, you know, digital wallets, mechanisms that can be potentially controlled by a consumer, by which only the needed data is collected. In privacy or in privacy engineering, we use the term data minimization. But many of us who are in the space know that increasingly, if, you know, we, in my environment or in the companies that I worked at previously, if I were just to sort of leave my engineering peers or some of my product development peers, you know, to their own, they may not necessarily just collect the minimum amount of data. They may collect several more attributes than, than what is really needed. So how do we ensure that in this space? Some, some have argued we can get more regulation into place, and that would be, you know, a good solution. How many times have we seen regulation circumvented? Would there be some sort of, you know, standard that we can come up with, like a verifiable data registry that in which the sorts of elements that one can have, you know, um, to certify and, and find a way to more readily represent that to the consumer, to the holder, so that they really know what is being collected on them? So I want to throw that out there, and I'm going to let Corey chime in on what you know he considers some of these issues to be, especially as it pertains to the differences here between privacy and security. Thanks, Evelyn, <clears throat> and thanks everyone else. This is really good. I just want to summarize some of the things that we've already talked about. I think there a lot of people don't fully understand that the relationship between security and privacy. It's very difficult. Um, in general, security needs to exist uh, in order to enforce privacy or to create privacy, but the reverse is not always true. You don't like you, you can have security without privacy. Um, and one thing I want to talk about today, what I've been doing recently is working with a team within Red Hat that, that focuses on data science. So Generally speaking, what happens on the internet stays on the internet forever. We all are aware of that. So data leaks happen. Um, we're usually the worst ones to provide those data leaks. So we've already released our name, birthday, address, email, things like that are already out there. Um, but in a data science world with machine learning, so you, you have what you create is a digital fingerprint or a data fingerprint per se. Um, I'll use an example of I think a lot of people have done with IoT is like a vacuum, a robotic vacuum. You probably have one in your house or you're going to get one. Um, you don't think about the fact that you're bringing that in and creating a data fingerprint uh, of yourself. So if people already know what town you live in, um, they know your age, they know uh, certain demographics about you, I can now use that data that's being collected from that vacuum, believe it or not. I now know the square foot of your home. So if I know the general area you live, I know probably your income based on the square feet of your home. I can also judge how much stuff you have in your house versus walls because of the mapping of that vacuum. I know how many bedrooms you have. Maybe you have kids now because I, I look at how many bedrooms you have. Let's say you have five bedrooms. That's that's a lot of bedrooms for somebody who's uh, single, right? So you, could, you can use those digital or data uh, fingerprints to train a machine learning model to tell me more about find this person based on these attributes um, and things like that. We don't think about that, but we release that. And it's very difficult, I think, today to have privacy. We have what's called maybe selective privacy. We, we want certain things not to be seen. And privacy is about observability. And so we have to think about that. That's that's a consumer thing. Like we don't think about that when we bring Alexa into our home or that robot vacuum. Uh, what data fingerprint are we creating out there that may leak at some point or that can be used today, even though it's been anonymized? Where where can it show up? Um, so some of these tools that have been talked about, like PKI and encryption, right? Those are digital tools in order to create controls around that. So if you don't want to live completely outside a digital system 
society, you have to use those those security tools. Uh, I mean, physical security always works. If you can get to space or Mars, like no one's probably going to see you there. <laughs> but if you want to live on Earth, you're going to have to use those those security tools and controls in order to create privacy. But it's selective because you've already put that information out there. You you can only control certain things that are that are leaked out there. And so um, I, like all these things are are where consumer protection laws uh, try to help educate the consumer. Like when you buy this device, what are you really signing up for? Uh, who can see this data? And um, yeah, with the data science, going back to that, uh, one of the things that we did recently was just uh, train a model on fingerprints and sometimes just knowing, uh, identifying, is this a male or a female? Like gender can be associated just with physical attributes um, that may not directly correlate. So we could find a fingerprint that appears to have no gender correlation and a machine learning model could extrapolate that. Same thing with these other with this other data sets that are coming out of IoT devices. So um, that yeah, just summarizing a lot of the things that have already been said, but I think people people need to be aware that it's selective privacy. We we've given up a lot of privacy in order to have uh, technology in our lives every day. So uh, I, I've had a question uh, for the group, uh, but I want to first see whether or not uh, there's any uh, any uh, that are coming in from the audience. Uh, I think I have a Q&A dialogue up, but uh, it doesn't appear there's any pending right now. But to follow up on the privacy stuff, and specifically with respect to consent-based uh, uh, privacy protocols, uh, probably one of the most hated protocols on the uh, internet right now for most consumers is the uh, uh, the we use cookies dialogue that everybody has to deal with. Um, and uh, that's claimed to be consent. You're giving the consumer uh, uh, an opportunity to agree or not to agree, but it can be very, very coercive in many cases. Many of those dialogues can be. So, um, uh, the concept of minimization was brought, uh, brought up, and, and uh, one of the examples of, uh, a, uh, a, a, of an ID where uh, you have age as uh, one of the attributes, uh, we've got technology nowadays that allows people to prove that uh, they have specific attributes. Um, do you see any of these being implemented? Do we see anything better than the, uh, the sort of crude uh, consent-based protocols that we have uh, today? What 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 do you think we can uh, do? You think we can do better than we have with respect to these kinds of things? Well, we can go deeper uh, at another point in time, but you know the uh, contract settlement for smart contracts, you know, uh, do have a number of criteria that are based on uh, key pairing, right? Uh, and that would allow for a yes or no uh, settlement or whatever without having to provide uh, ancillary or, or concentric information in order to settle that contract or that transaction, if you will. Um, but, and then there are other things as well. I'm sure other others on the team have some ideas. Evelyn, can you give us some examples of the uh, uh, consent-based uh, uh, protocols that uh, can help us uh, preserve uh, privacy? Yes, and unfortunately, something has gone out of my mind, and I was just actually trying to Google it. Um, but there is a consent-based mechanism that um, you know has come up, which is sort of helping, if you will, with the regulating of cookies, where today what we're finding is that, so I'll use that as an example and then talk about how that could be parlayed into this IoT um, because I, you know, I feel like I painted a, a pretty bleak picture. Um, so I feel like, um, you know, one of the things that came about with the cookie based, um, you know, having to consent every time is that people, you know, typically visit about 15 different websites. I'm just using that as an example. And each time they're getting one of these notices and, um, you know, they really just want to get something done. And many times they'll just you know, they are often forced to accept sometimes these, the terms and conditions before they can move on. But different vendors, um, Mozilla is one, and then there was another one, a universal sort of program that which I can't remember the name for, in which um, 
you know, some companies are moving towards. And that's what I see the opportunity for with this um, in, you know, what we talked about with this digital identity that, you know, there needs to be stronger consumer awareness regulation to date sometimes has helped but other times you know the issuers and verifiers sort of find a way around that if there can be like the equivalent of this um, framework that came up for the cookie can, um, way to handle that I think we might find that you know we'll reach a state where consumers are better aware of what is being held in their identity You know, I think in general, uh, Evelyn brings up a good point is uh, for sure with regards to the consumer awareness. I mean, people don't realize that, you know, your digital presence or you, your, you as an individual on the internet, for example, you know, is really governed by others, right? I mean, it's Ted at somebody, somebody else's domain. Um, and if they decided that, you know, they would want to just delete my user ID, if you will, and I, it's interesting they call those user IDs. We can get into that at another soapbox time, but you know, then you have no digital presence, right? So self-sovereignty, self-sovereignty uh, is part of the future. People call it self-sovereign identity, and everyone got up in arms because of the name itself. What connotations appeared in that? But the concept of verifiable credentials. Uh, and the, the the you know DIDs, which are part of their addressing schema. But the, the point is verifiable credentials offers us the ability uh, to be uh, in control uh, and have your own identity. So perhaps maybe in, in June, we can drill into that as an organization, as a team, uh, not, not trying to set the agenda here, but just you know opening that up because I think the the consumer awareness that Evelyn has hit on, hit on is key. And then also Corey mentioned consumer awareness, the things that people just buy these you know, thermostats and, you know, and robots and stuff. And Alexa was a big thing, you know, and they don't realize that, you know, there's absolutely information being captured, aggregated, and then analyzed for whatever purpose, you know, maybe positive, but certainly uh, your private home, uh, your privacy in your home, I don't care if anybody has positive or negative intent, it doesn't matter, it's private. So, uh, we all, I think, should, would, I think, be uh, benefiting our audience by drilling more into consumer uh, knowledge and awareness and impact. I also think sent sentiment has changed. Uh, if we're looking at demographically, uh, I think also human behavior has evolved uh, generationally. I think, I, I mean, I've seen this in myself. I think older generations are more concerned about privacy of their data whereas younger generations generally don't care about it as much. They're willing to put it out there. I mean, like Twitter is everything going on in the world, I guess. And, and like some people are okay with that. And, and I think that's, that's the challenge is where's the standard? Like where's that bar or threshold that says, hey, you've exceeded a level of comfort around privacy. Like that's very hard to, to set as it changes generationally. Yeah, I think also there's a there's there's an issue where we have uh, more than just um, privacy per se, but just the fact that uh, let's say you have a lot of devices in your uh, uh, apartment or your home, and um, they've got some identity associated with them. They could be rights to, to 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 deal with them, to make changes on security cameras and motion sensors and all of those kinds of things, and then you get up and move. And uh, all of those things are embedded in your house. And I haven't seen any place. I mean, Pennsylvania, for example, I found out has a law that says if you're selling your house and you got these things, you have to do something about that. But no one really needs to, uh, no one uh, knows really how to deal with it except for to uh, go ahead and uh, figure out how to take all the identity information out of these devices, which is yeah. actually not very realistic in, in even the cases of people who are knowledgeable about the, uh, about the devices themselves. I think there's a bigger problem where you've got these legacy systems that, that are out there and they can't support the technology of certificates and things like that. So what do you do about those entities? I mean, and, you know, especially, you know, once again, in the industrial side of the house, everything's 
pretty much out, you know, analog. Um, and then they use other protocols. But how do you how do you verify identity in 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 those devices without something like a gateway? Um, that seems to be the you know, accomplishment where the true endpoint does not really verified as itself, but it's verified in the gateway itself. The gateway provides that functionality and you're communicating with that and you're dependent upon that. But I think it's just one of those things where there's been discussions where, you know, kind of going forward where devices have to pass a certain level of certification. They have to certify to, to meet this criteria. And, you know, there's this, you know, one standard I've heard our framework, I should say, and call PSA. You know, it's uh, so that's that's one possibility. But I just look at it, and I whenever I go to conventions and stuff like that, I just always look and to see what kind of answer they have for these legacy systems, because I think that's a I think that's the elephant in the room. Is like how do you how do you secure those things that can't do certificates, that can't do this, can't do that? You know, what are they? What are they? How do they accomplish that? And typically, it's uh, I don't I don't get a good answer. I mean, at this point in time. It seems to me like it's a, a, a open for uh, per, uh, performance aid services. Somebody coming in and said, I'll, I'll do all this for you. But uh, right. I, if I were to even to start up a business like that, it, it seems to me it would be very, very challenging to do that. <laughs> yeah, and even setting up like zero trust, like I was saying earlier, or even SASE, right? It's, you know, it's the level of complexity is pretty, pretty high. Um, but the act of doing it, the resources it takes to, to just initially set it up, but also stay on top of it is quite a bit. It's not a, it's not an easy task. It's, it's one of those things where you have to be diligent and, um, and stay on top of it um, to, uh, to make it actually work um, well. And um, you takes, you know, knowledge, training, things like that, but just the sheer act of going through that process, the implementation, and then the operational aspect of it, it's, it's, um, it's a daunting task, you know, and there's uh, my hats off to the organizations that can do that. But um, um, it's, uh, you know, it's the world we live in that requires those resources. So one thing you reminded me of that we, we talked about in infrastructure is life cycling, like life cycling of infrastructure. And I think the same thing, even with digital certificates, we generally have an expiration, right? We, we assume that security or control will expire at a certain point. Um, and I don't think we think about that like individuals, the common person doesn't think about life cycling their their digital identity or the security around it. And maybe that's maybe that's one of the things that we need to try and like do as a society is try and get people thinking about that. Right. There's a shelf life to it. Right. I agree. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree uh, to that one. I mean, the, the, some of the most painful experiences that I've had on administering uh, PKI has to do with the expiration of certificates. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, you, you could say, oh, this one's going to expire in 10 years from now. And you just sort of forget about it and 10, 10 years shows up. And oh, my goodness, these <laughs> certs are expiring. Now, what do I do? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a bit like, you know, when computers first got mainstream and everyone had to learn to apply updates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's that sort of thing, you know, where, you know, it took a while for consumers to latch on that that was a thing. I think the same thing will happen with expiring certificates. Right. Good point. Uh, by the way, so there was one question came in is how do you spell sassy? <laughs> it spells a yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, there you go. It's not S A, it's not S A S S Y, it's uh S A S E. And um right. I, I chuckle every time I have to say it, you know, inside. I just think it's hysterical. But um it's a service, you know, it's it's really kind of a the concept is really a service and it's a comprehensive solution. But uh I think they've made pretty good inroads into that, you know, just building upon zero trust, but uh they have a ways to go you know, frankly. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, I think we're uh, pretty much at the end of our uh, time. And so I want to thank everybody here. Uh, it, it's been uh, a very simulating conversation as, 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 uh, as our previous ones have, have been. And uh, again, I want to thank everybody. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll 
uh, get together uh, again soon. I think we're going to have a live uh, session in North Carolina. Is that it? Well, <clears throat> first of all, let me <clears throat> echo what was a fantastic session that you guys have just delivered here. Again, as always, now it seems to be set a standard and you're out of raising the bar on all these deep dives in, in the security, privacy, and trust domain. I and mean, wh where do you begin with that as the elephant in the room? Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful panel team. It was an amazing discussion. To your question, um, David, yes, we're going to be back in um, a live capacity in June, um, 21, 22, to be specific, and that will be at the SAS Global Headquarters, no less, um, in Cary, North Carolina. And um, there's a, actually a second live event as well that we're going to be delivering in 2023, which will be um, in December at the HPE Global Headquarters in Texas. So we've got not one, but in fact, two live events that you and everyone else, you know, that are looking forward to being in a live capacity can look forward to here with IT community. And then there's a middle pin in between that in September, which will be another virtual event. Um, but we have reached the end of the time, not just in fact for this session, but for day one of IoT Day Slam. It's been an amazing day. Um, we're kind of still adjusting with this four hour time difference with the US. So it's thrown a few of the logistics um, into free fall, but we've been able to uh, adapt and adjust and want to take time to say thanks to all of those folks who have been with us from start to finish. I've seen some folks names that I've seen from the first session right the way through till the end here, both here on, on, on Zoom, but equally on our LinkedIn live bridge. We've, we've had a lot of interaction and engagement there as well. And um, for those who have those links, you don't have to wait until the content is post-produced. You can just literally go back to LinkedIn Live and hit play, and you'll be able to see that content right away. So um, for any of those sessions you've missed from the morning part, including this whole four-hour block that we've been broadcasting here as one mega bridge um, over on LinkedIn Live. So um, what I will say, folks, we'll be back with you again at 9.20 tomorrow. Um, give you an extra hour sleep in than we have here today at 8 30 starts so um 9 20 tomorrow um we have cisco opening up our morning keynote so please do join us for that and as we bring this one to a close i want to just say again thank you so much david evelyn corey george ted for being a part of this helping us close out the iot day slam day one and we'll be uh in touch with you and, and everyone very very soon all the best to you stay safe and god bless cheers Thank, Thank you, you, Kevin. Congratulations on the successful day one. Thank you, team. And David, great job pulling this together. Appreciate it. Take care, all. Thank you. Bye. Cheers, guys.